Uh, Petra, how Hi, are you? Jonathan, I'm fine, thank you. I don't know why it does this sometimes. It um, sometimes people write and say, "Oh, you're on a meet on another meeting," but no, I'm just waiting. <laughs> no, how it's fine. It, it happens these things because, like, with with different meetings going on and stuff, I, I completely understand these technology. Hopefully, one day we'll all be able to speak in person rather than doing it over the internet, eh? I know, I know. Wouldn't that be great? But um, um, so much congratulations for your new appointment. Thank you. Um, so you are now a conductor at um, Birmingham Royal Ballet. Uh, no, it's actually the uh, position of staff conductor. It's the latest announcement with the Royal Ballet at the Royal Opera House Covent Garden. Oh, at the, oh I see. Okay. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, it's. Uh, it, it, I mean, I also have a um, very strong relationship with Birmingham Royal Ballet. It is yeah. the company that gave me my beginning in um, the world of ballet. Um, as you might know that um, for conductors, conducting in ballet is a very um, specialist subject. Mm. Um, it is still seen as a bit of a dark art even, but um, not necessarily so. The only reason why that is is because it, um, it requires a very specific skill set, which can only be gained through a lot of hands-on experience. But of course, ballet companies are reluctant to try conductors who haven't had previous experience. Mm. So Birmingham Royal Ballet ran this wonderful conducting fellowship at the um, earlier part of my career, where they essentially mentored me together with um, Rombert Dance Company, actually, who used to be Ballet Rombert, um, but they now specialize in more contemporary music. Um, and the two companies essentially gave me my initial insights into conducting for dance. That is so amazing that you had that opportunity. So did you work alongside Paul Murphy? Yeah, yeah, Paul and I uh, know oh. each other very well. Um, also, uh, Kuhn, who is both, Kuhn Kessels, who's both at... Oh, uh, yeah, Birmingham. I spoke to and both also, of them. Yeah. Yes, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm not surprised because um, they... <laughs> are such experienced conductors, especially in the world of ballet. Um, mm. And I'm sure they have wonderful things to say about the profession. Yeah, no, they, they, it was very insightful. And, you know, for, for somebody who, who's not in the ballet world or, um, or doesn't know much about the world of a conductor, um, you know, these things, we, we don't realize this, you know, that it's, it's a specific, that you have to be specifically trained almost to do that yeah no absolutely um and i think um the initial impression when mm. it comes to um people thinking okay so you're a conductor and so then that brings a load of questions of what a conductor does and then mm. when you bring in the extra element of so you are a conductor for dance um of course a lot of people immediately come to the conclusion that okay so you have to get all those speeds or the tempo right yeah. Um, but I think that is, of course, important, um, but the it, it's only a small part of it. Mm. Um, I think one of our main jobs, as in any form of conducting, um, is to be a, a facilitator and to be a communicator between people. Um, but the biggest difference between a conductor for symphony orchestras or opera or even musical theatre is that all the people that you work with essentially speak the same language, that is music. Um, but when you bring in dancers, their first language is dance, is the phrases of the choreography, is the tempo of their body, um, is the phrasing of, of their artistry. And that is, whilst often they should occupy the same work of art and the same time frame, they don't always speak the same language in that we have the musical score with us, but they have the choreography um, in front of them, which is a, which is often a different. Um, they, it, the, the, the starting point is different. Mm. Um, and sometimes the small nuance of articulation and the small nuance of um, phrasing of um, of, of dynamic is different. Mm. So it is then down to us, the conductors, just like you would in opera and just like you would in orchestra, where you are the diplomat between um, the, the, the people who play um, the cellos and the people who are singing a role on stage 
And so then we are liaising. We are we are trying to facilitate the relationship between the orchestra and the dancers on stage. So I guess our first and foremost job, as well as being a musician, is to be a good media, a good negotiator. Oh, yeah. But uh, this is um, uh, so interesting because I've been now uh, recently talking to um, uh, a conductor and, and uh, it's actually a, a, a workshop uh, or the uh, masterclass that they're doing now between singers and conductors or, or they do the, this masterclass together. And the, mm -hmm. the, the whole uh, um, idea is that they learn from each other and that they learn to communicate in, in, mm. in, a, in a better way. Do you think this is mm. also something very important between a, a conductor for ballet, between you and the, the dancers? Absolutely. Um, because I think what's interesting is that the communication between opera singers and conductors is that they're essentially talking about the same text, not so mm. much the work of art, but the, but, but the text in front of them is the same. It is a score. It is the yeah. notes that the composer gave them. But when it comes to communication between the conductor and the dancer, the text that we have is different. I have the score of, say, Swan Lake in front of me, yeah. but their score, their um, choreography, is different to what we have there. The, 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 the choreography is not necessarily what Tchaikovsky intended in terms of the phrasing, in terms of the dynamic, in terms mm -hmm. of sometimes even the dramatic intentions when you have a modern adaptation of Romeo and Juliet, for example. Oh, yeah. um, and so, and that, that is the bigger shape of the communication, but also there are smaller things, really small details of how, um, you know, the basic of how quickly and how slowly you play a piece of yeah. music. But when we speak of tempo, the, mm. the, the, the feeling is often very different to when a dancers speak of a mm. tempo. Because our starting point is, first and foremost, the, composer in, the composer's instruction, how fast they want a piece to go. And then our feeling for the music, the musician's feeling for the music. But the dancer's feeling for the tempo, for the speed could be very different. Um, sometimes when they are feeling particularly on top of, say, an arabesque, a holding step, a moment when they really want to stretch the music, sometimes mm. they might demand the music to go a little bit slower mm. so that they have more time to sustain. Likewise, when they want to do many, many turns, many, many pirouettes, um, sometimes they want you to give them more time to fit that in because mm. that's their uh, moment. And I liken that to us when we conduct for a concerto soloist. Mm. Um, and trying to reconcile how to make the concerto soloist sounds really good, how mm. we can make the dancers look really good. But the main difference is we don't speak the same text. In the same way that when a dancer comes to us and say, um, can we have this music a little bit slower or a little bit faster, or it doesn't feel quite right, mm. because they don't have the same text in front of them, often they are not immediately able to say, actually, it's not that it needs to be faster, but we need to have more breath in between phases, oh, more rubato in mm, between. Mm, um, mm. So it's often our job, and I guess that's where the specialism comes, is to um, help with that part of the communication. Mm, mm. Yeah, I, I'm, uh, and now I understand what you mean. It's, it's like how they phrase it also to you, you know, like uh, saying slower or faster, but it, it means something else for them in their head and you have to understand what they're saying. But yes, how, absolutely. Yeah, how is this, how did, did this interest in the ballet and conducting ballet came to you? Um, well, Actually, um, so I was very fortunate, as I was saying earlier, mm -hmm. um, to be the conducting fellow for Birmingham Royal Ballet and Rombe Dance Company. Mm -hmm. It was a moment of good luck, really, and serendipity. Um, mm -hmm. I had just finished my um, education um, after my studies at university and a postgraduate degree. And as you, as all young conductors um, do, we were going around the competition circuits, trying to do guest engagements here and there. Um, and this opportunity came up and I thought, well, why not give it a go? And I went in without knowing what to expect at all. Um, I remember going into Birmingham for the very first time. And the very first thing they asked me to do was to go and sit and watch a ballet class. 
mm. um, where it, which is the, the the daily exercise that the ballet dancers do together with a pianist and a teacher who gives some of the exercises every day. And I remember sitting in the corner room thinking, I have absolutely no idea what's going on. Oh, okay. Everybody was speaking in a language that I don't understand. Everybody was in, essentially communicating in gesture only mm-hmm. um, and with an occasional mumbling of words. And then the pianist seems to know exactly what is to happen. And then it was then followed by a full rehearsal of Coppelia. I remember it very well. Um, and again, going into the studio and it, everything just happens in a, mm-hmm. it, in a magical clockwork way. It was as if I was transported into this machine where everybody knew exactly what they were doing and not just knew what they were doing, but they were they knew exactly how to do it to a world class level. And I remember thinking, wow, I was I was really drawn to it because of the teamwork of it and and, and the functioning of it and the sheer energy um, of the studio where there was high class virtuosity on display by the dancers, but there was also really high level music making on display from the conductors and from the pianist. And then I remember going to see the show for the first time um, and being blown away by um, the, the, the enthusiasm of the audience and, and the energy between the audience, the orchestra and the stage. Mm. Um, and I think I, I, I made a point at the time that I was really interested in it and I wanted to know more about it. But what I thought was really important was how um, BRB and Rombert went about running the fellowship. Mm. They didn't try to make me into a ballet conductor. At all times, they were trying to relate conducting for ballet into conducting in general and into music in general. Because the ultimate goal, and now that I've gone through that experience and now on the other side in my position as music director of Northern Ballet, is that the ultimate goal is that we would encourage conductors to be able to do ballet, but not necessarily do that as the only thing they do. Um, So that conductors can be in the opera house um, for a month and then do concerts for a month and then come and do ballet for a month. Then that we try and open up this art form and this sector to conductors altogether. For too long, conductors who who do ballet end up doing ballet, but nothing else. And conductors who don't do ballet don't get the chance to do ballet, and therefore they never get to conduct scores, wonderful music, like Romeo and Juliet, Cinderella of Prokofiev, and all the Stravinsky ballets, all the Tchaikovsky ballets, in an actual ballet setting, and to experience what the music was intended for, and how it fits with the choreography and with the drama. Um, So the more we can open up this world, and this was what attracted me into the world in the first place, is the more we open it up, the more we can then relate it to our music making altogether, and the better it is for everybody. Wow, but this, you you gave me goosebumps now when you started talking about this, uh, how the ballet function, and, and yes, for, for somebody looking at it like that way, it must have been uh, was it daunting for you in the in the beginning to to uh, not be able to you know know what was going on there? Oh, Petra, it it, it still has moments that dawned me oh, even just... now. Um, you it, because as as a conductor, we go and prepare as much as possible for our scores. So you know, we go into a studio and we can speak as much about the music as we can, as we can prepare ourselves, as, as we do our best to. But the moment you get into the studio, um, mm. the dancer's choreography and their virtuosity and their, and, and their physicality, the first time you go into it, it it's, it's nevertheless, it's still a very exciting experience. It's like arriving into a country for the very first time. You can read as much about the guidebooks and on the internet about the city that you're going to arrive in the first time as possible. And that very first time you step out of the airport, there's still a moment of, Oh wow! Oh, right. And it is it is it, it 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 still excites me and it still dawns me and I hope it will always excite me and it will always give me that goosebumps mm. because it is ultimately our job to help the dancers be help the dancers wow help the productions wow everybody who come and see the show mm. and if we as conductors go in and be wowed by it in the first place 
then we know what it's like to experience that magic. And if we can then help translate that wow factor when mm. we go and perform it, all the better. Uh, but of course, there are also the initial things that you know we had to learn as conductors. So going mm. in and understanding all the terminology, mm. um, you know, what a jeté is, what a pirouette oh, yeah. is, what yeah. a lame duck, what a torpique, yeah. what all those things are. Um, as well, as well as other things like that, you you start to understand the the the, the more detailed nuance. So, mm. okay, this step is difficult for the dancer, but why is it difficult? Where are the difficult corners? Is it that they want you to not ne never let the music energy sag? So the music always has to give them the energy to go. So to put it in one word, to push them, mm. or is it the step where you they always need space, but not space that is arrived at simply by being slower, mm. but say it's based so that you play the phrase and you always give them a breath and then you start the next phrase, that sort of space. And then the next level, level of nuance, which is, okay, so every dancer has their particular interpretation of a phrase. So they like to do something different and they like you to approach the music differently. Some dancers like you to be really accommodating and to give them rubato and they know exactly what pull-ups and what accelerando they want. Some dancers just want you to play exactly the same every night. Mm. And then they play around with the music because there are these phrases, and it's really interesting you ask about um, the dauntingness and, and, mm. and, and the communication, because actually there are lots of words which are the same between music and dance. Um, mm. You know, faster, slower, allegro, adagio, yeah. legato, staccato, um, all the uh, dynamics, we talk about the same thing, but I, what I find really interesting is that both art forms talk about rubato, but mm. we don't talk about it as often enough, I think, um, as we should between musicians and dancers, mm. because whilst we do rubato and we pull up, they can do rubato too, but they can only do it if they know exactly what music they're going to get. Um, oh, so yeah. sometimes, you, you know, if you, if, if you play the music um, mm. and you try and match with their rubato, they will go, well, why are you bending the music to me? Because what mm. they're essentially doing, sometimes they say they stay on an attitude, they stay on a holding step um, mm. for longer than the music allows them to, but then they dance the next step really, really fast, then to catch oh, up see. for the yeah, next moment. Yeah. So they actually really honor the true meaning of the word rubato, which comes from the Italian rubare, to steal. They are literally stealing time from the music yeah. and then to make up for it. Mm. Um, so it's the, you, you go from the really basic of understanding, OK, what a step is, to really trying to understand what each dancer's habit is. But all at the same time, honoring what our job is, which is to look after the musicians and to come up with a musically satisfying performance. Mm. So that if the dancers say, okay, I want to take time here, I want the music to take time here, I want the music to go faster here, then we go back to the score and say, okay, how can I make this sound right and make this sound good? Alternatively, if a dancer asks us to play, basically play roughly the same timing for them every time so that they can <laughs> do the rubato that they want and not be put off by us suddenly doing our rubato and not matching up with theirs. See, yeah, How yeah. do we make our music alive and fresh when we're trying to do it the same every night? So we mm. might find different phrasing and different crescendo, different sense of climax whilst honoring the same timing in the music. And this is why live music is important because mm. we can respond to the individuals that are performing on stage whilst mm. at the same time keeping it fresh and alive in the pit. Wow, and, and now it makes so much sense to me because uh, when I both when I spoke to, to um, uh, uh, Kun and, um, and Paul, I thought, amazing how much insight they have in the ballet world. You know, they spoke about the ballet, uh, the dancers and, and what the dancers went through. And now what you're saying to me, of course, you are so in tuned with what they're doing and, and, and you know, because you, you have to have this understanding for them. But do you find that you have, say, for principal dancers, for example, when, when it's different casts and, and so you have, 
you know, three nights, three different dancers. But it's not just um, it's not just one prince. So, so say, it, it, for example, if the the female role and the male role. So how do you you have to and this is so it's not just one dancer on the stage. There are say two that you have to accommodate. So how do you manage that? Because that can be quite tricky, I, I assume. And the only way to really understand that and manage it is to really invest time in the studio. Mm. Um, being in the rehearsals beforehand, you know, um, conductors are so used to going into rehearse the orchestra and then go in, into the theatre, do the stage orchestra and be the maestro and come and do the show and then go home. Um, but I find those studio time to be the most valuable opportunity to not just learn the um, interpretation of the ballet, which mm. you get from the ballet staff who are teaching and rehearsing the ballet. Um, also, of course, to understand the tempi and the corners and the communicate, but also to really watch the dynamic of the dancers um, in the studio. Okay. You can really, just by sitting in the corner and watching and observing, um, understand their individual personalities, the personalities between the two of them, um, and how they respond to each other, and also what they feel like and what they look like when they're tired or when they are excited or when they're really on the top of the game. Mm -hmm. And you can only really do that by spending an extended period of time in the studio with them. Yes, of course, there are times when you are busy, other conductors are busy and they go in, they can only spend two days in the studio. And that's one way of doing it. But if you can say, spend a week with a cast in the studio from Monday, when they've just had the weekend off and they're just coming back and they're slowly experiencing and feeling things, um, through the rehearsal process when they are just expect and, and you know feeling um, the partnership and trying to try things out to Friday when they're really going um, for it, you then get a full picture of what they are like as a person. Mm. Um, and then you can use that information to help our understanding when we're doing the performance to really see, okay, they look tired now or they look right on the top of the game and they can now do anything or okay. the partnership looks wonderful everything's working or you can tell that something isn't quite right and you adjust yourself to it um so it's that studio time to get to understand them to try and manage the different casts and of course over the rehearsal process you can spend time with different casts and different um people and that's the that's the best way to understand them and to get to, and to get to know them uh, but this is also um, something I spoke to a conductor about, and that is that, and I actually spoke to um, some young conductors who graduated here at the MDV, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Music University. Um, and I asked them this question because I, I assume you also have to have a, a connection with your orchestra. And, uh, and uh, uh, these young uh, uh, the graduates, uh, they told me that the orchestra was this wonderful orchestra and they just, you know, it was very easy to, I think they had two hours rehearsal time with the orchestra. Um, and I also spoke to another uh, conductor uh, recently who, who has done many competitions in conducting. And I asked the same thing, how do you connect in these competitions because you haven't worked with the, with the orchestra before? And he said that it's a skill to, to be able to just step up and and immediately connect with the orchestra but now in your situation i'm thinking it's it's not so much this connection it, it is obviously important that you connect with the orchestra but would you be able to jump in like a, a, in a in a ballet performance where you haven't met the dancers and and haven't seen the rehearsals would you be able to do that as a ballet conductor Oh, I, I wouldn't recommend it. Um, oh, okay. I mean, I would I would pro I would do that in a situation where I've done, say, the Nutcracker with Birmingham. I've done I've done that many many times. I've done it in consecutive seasons, and I know the choreography and I know the dancers um, very well. And I have their, uh, you know, I, I have I have their trust, and mm -hmm. I think that's that's the important part of the um, rehearsal process that you need to one needs to win their trust. Mm. Um, I think with an orchestra, because you see, you speak the same language and yeah. you you occupy the same musical text, um, they can work out 
your personality and, and they they can they can they can start to trust you very quickly mm. um but even so i i'm sure when you speak to orchestral musicians they talk about their trust in the conductor mm. in that so when the conductor does something different and a bit outrageous they go okay do you know what they will then help us back into it all i i can really trust them to take us into this journey which we've mm. not really experienced in rehearsals before to take us up a level that trust in performance and it's the same for for, for dancers um and i would I, I, I don't think I would recommend going to a performance yeah. where you've never met the orchestra, the dancers, or seen any rehearsals because nobody nobody has that trust in you at that moment and everybody starts to get nervous and when people get nervous, they start, start to do um, interesting things. But also, ultimately, in, in conducting for ballet, it is that relationship that is most important and that okay. understanding of the choreography mm. and of the dancers that's most important. Whereas in um, a concert setting, even to an extent in opera, the conductor is the ultimate decider of the interpretation. In mm. ballet, it is we are part of the team. And that is why it's so wonderful to do, because we can we, we can take a back seat almost a little bit and be part of the team and and work and really understand what it is to be in a collaborative collaborative process. And that helps us to translate and to work better in a, in a concert and opera setting as well. That's so great to hear. And, and I'm thinking now with, that you're explaining this um, and you're saying before you said that it would be great to, to have conductors do different things, you know, that they don't just get stuck into. Um, but um, uh, what is the, then of all the conducting, what is your favorite uh, um, thing to conduct then? Is it, is it the opera, the ballet, or, or just orchestra conducting? Uh, that's probably the hardest question um, okay. for any musicians, really. Um, I think I, I've been really lucky to have enjoyed a career so far where I have, I, I do, I do pretty much everything apart from musicals. And I would love to, I, I'd love to try musicals. I, I'd love to try my hands at that, that one day. Um, but I, you know, I, in in my in my diary, I have choirs, I have concerts, I have ballet. Um, not so much opera now because the, the 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 timing of opera ballet is it, it overlaps. But I think I I will always have it, it. It depends on what the mood is, and it depends on what I've done a lot of. So if I've done six months of orchestra um, and of six months of ballet, what I would really love is to go and do the Matthew Passion or something mm. and I think ultimately there is a part of me that, that there is a part of my heart that is always dedicated to 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 the to, to that sort of music to the oratorio um mm. to the to the Deutsche Requiem um to all the all the big great works of of, of Bach and all the all the all the Mendelssohn oratorio because yeah. that's where I started my conducting um I started my conducting conducting choirs um oh, and okay. Yeah, because um, when I was um, at school, actually, way back, um, I moved to this country when, when I was 14. Um, I was born in Hong Kong. Um, and, and when I was growing up um, in Hong Kong, classical music is really cool. It's not mm. like in the West where you, you, you always feel like it's a, it's a battle to get young people to go and see classical music. In Hong mm. Kong, it's young people who go to classical music. Really? Um, yeah, and I remember my friends and I would, um, you know, we would spend the summer just basically going through all the record shops and listening to CDs and sharing experience of of Mahler symphonies. I remember standing at really? bus stops, just waiting yeah. for bus after bus to pass because we were standing around talking about Mahler or, yeah. or, or, or or any of those symphonies. And so when I moved over, um, I thought, you know, I, I I I would love to try my hands to be a conductor. Mm -hmm. um and so i went to school what went was speak. your what was your instrument that you played i i was i played the french horn really um, oh, I okay. yeah. yeah and yeah. it's interesting you bring up instrument because when i when i came to um, and the piano and when i came to this country um and i obviously played in the orchestra and all that sort of stuff but i went to speak to my director of music at school and i said you know i really want to try conducting and being the english um public school that it is it, it's it's got a lovely tradition of sending people to oxford and cambridge 
um, mm. and in Oxford and Cambridge, there's this really wonderful system of chapel choirs, um, which has this history over you know 400, 500 years. Mm. Um, and they and he said to me, well, if you want to, if you want to conduct, the best way to start out is mm. to go and be an organ scholar. Because if you're an organ scholar at one of the Oxford or Cambridge colleges, then you essentially run the choir and you become the director of music of the, of the choir. Oh, and so you get very regular podium time. Yeah. Except there was one small problem in that <laughs> I had never played the organ before in my okay. life. Um, he spoke to me about this when I was 16 and I then had to go and do my audition on the organ when I was 17. And he said to me, well, you can play the piano. They you know, just just go and yeah. learn the organ. So I spent a whole summer frantically learning the organ, practicing, mm -hmm. going to courses, learning repertoire um, and cut a long story short. Um, they gave me the organ scholarship at Oxford. And mm -hmm. so um, I was conducting a choir for the first three years, essentially, of my conducting mm -hmm. career because I was essentially um uh, music director of the of the chapel choir oh, okay um and so I, I i will always love that part of um choral music um and it was the music that helped me assimilate into the uk as well it, it helped me under it helped me into this culture um and so if i think if i ever if if you were asked you were to ask me about my desert island music to conduct I probably won't be able to tell you what um, the orchestra or the ballet or opera pieces are, mm. but I will definitely be able to tell you that choral music will feature in it without really? a doubt. Yeah. That is so interesting uh, that that, yeah, but that was your start. So it's it's probably where, where this, the whole um, feeling for it started, you know? And, and I think I think there is um, the lev that there is a small amount of um, spiritualism in choral music. Mm. Um, you know, so much of the great works um, for choirs in the Western um, classical music genre is based around Christianity. Mm. Um, and but especially, I, I came I came to an interesting um, feeling. I wouldn't say understanding because mm. I think. You can always learn, you can always understand more. But I came to an interesting feeling of it when I did the um, Deutsche Requiem um, about a year ago, um, mm. just before the pandemic, actually. And um, to try and understand that piece through not the prism of Christianity, but through the prism of humanity, mm. it, it it gave me a lot of comfort and a lot of, um, un, a, 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 yeah, comfort. Mm. Um and and a lot of warmth about humanity mm -hmm. it was almost as if when i was hearing that piece in my ears or in my head and i was going for a walk around the city the world made sense um mm -hmm. or made more sense in this difficult age of division and you know uh, uh, of, of 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 all the difficult topics that we have to talk about these days that piece really brought a lot of it back to home and it helped us look inward and reflect into ourselves and if I was to choose a piece of music to spend a lot of time with, mm. just for me, then I think the spiritualism of the choral music world has a lot to offer. Mm. But you know, I uh, I used to live in Windsor, and I oh, wow. um, yeah, and I um, there at the at the St George's Chapel, they had uh, in the afternoons at five. Yes. Um, uh, 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 like an hour where you, where you go and there was always a choir singing it was like this little service that they had mm. and that music and that the sound of the choir in that church I think it's the stone of the church you know the stone that that also uh, reflects the sound or I don't know what it is but that half an hour when you sit there and you hear that those sounds, because it sounds, it doesn't sound like a group of people singing. It really sounds like one, one sound. Mm. Um, but I always felt so relaxed when I get out there. I almost felt that more, uh, you know, more than even going to a spa and get a massage, mm. I would prefer going there for that half an hour because of how it made me feel when I go out again, you know, it's that the, the, the sound of that choral music in that environment 
it was so so uh, touching and so relaxing you know so i, I totally can completely what understand you what you're saying mm. yeah I, to- I totally know what you mean um and that that part that that relaxation that calmness that's tr- that yeah. tranquility um is is such a big part of my draw into that choral music had i gone from school to go and try and conduct orchestras I think I would end up being a very different musician to what I am now because I went from school to trying con- to, to conducting choirs to conducting that um, everyday um, musical happenings at, at 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 the church, which is a very unique British um, tradition called the choral even song, um, mm. literally the song of the evening, um, and yeah, yeah. that 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 helped me connect music with humanity and with our spiritual needs and our um and our, and our soul the food for our soul mm. um and that that helped me place music at a slightly higher level than just entertainment mm. um or a grandeur of a public form of art which is what the symphony and the opera and the ballet um mm. is it's a public display of art yes your response is intimate but ultimately it's it's a show for the audience uh, yeah. but choir and especially in the choral even song performance setting is very different um it's a much more meditative experience it's much more yeah. introverted experience but it's also really interesting you bring you, you bring up the topic of the architecture of the space mm. of the church um it its success and its unique specialness mm. comes i think from the fact that they are singing music performing music which is written for that same space all the time um, when composers wrote and conceived all these pieces of music for Corey Evensong, they envisaged them to be sung in churches with the stones and with the organ and with the screens and what bouncing, reflecting off the sound. Whereas, mm. you know, when Brahms wrote the fourth symphony, he 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 had the Meiningen Hofkapelle in mind. So he had a particular space and a particular acoustic mm. in mind. But now it's probably quite, you know, you might hear that piece in Meiningen once every two season maybe but you hear that all around the world in these different concert halls and different settings but choral evensong you hear the music in the space where it's supposed to be heard all the time and that gives us something special to an extent that there was a composer called Herbert Howells Englishman um, lived not very far from where I am here actually in southwest London and he started out as a composer um, and as a music student, when he was still early on in his composing career, as a tour guide for oh, cathedrals. Yeah. And when he was writing this, all this music for Choral Evensong for that hour in the evening for British churches, he very specifically titled them with buildings in mind. So there would be the evening service for St. Paul's Cathedral. There'll be mm. the evening service for Gloucester Cathedral. There'll be the evening, evening service for King's College, Cambridge. Mm. And within the music, you can really hear the building because he wrote the building into the music, Amazing. which sounds like a very new um, idea, but it's a tradition you can find all the way back mm. to the very early composers like Dufay um, mm. in, in the early um, 16th, 15th century. Um, and Herbert Howells does it with colour. Um, so in the Gloucester evening service for Gloucester Cathedral, for example, it, it starts with um, the two treble soprano top line um, singing the same phrase, but they overlap each other slightly. Uh, Feshibung, um, that, that sort of shifting of sound, um, the sort of merging of sound um, in a very bright key of F sharp major. And when you go to Gloucester Cathedral, one of the first thing that strikes you is the stained glass window. Um, that they that that you can you can see the light that shines through and merges, which is absolutely gorgeous. Wow. Um, oh, and you can amazing. hear that. Yeah. And, and and you can hear that in in the in 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 the music. And likewise mm. for um, the King's College um, service that he wrote, and likewise for the St Paul service that he mm. wrote. Well, you know that I think that in in this case, I think we subconsciously. Um, then understand the music in that space or in that environment better because I don't think we always consciously, uh, uh, you know, reason 
but but uh, probably when he wrote it that way then and and you go in that building you will mm. sense it that way you know mm. Mm. absolutely yeah i i find it really fascinating how the sound in these old churches really fill the space you you almost as if you hear it coming from the roof you know and coming from the sides and coming from it it almost uh surrounds you you know it it uh, um it totally uh comes from everywhere and i just love that yeah that is amazing yeah, absolutely mm. and i think it's it, it there are very few acoustics like that um mm. you know in, in the concert hall everything is focused um on the mm. stage whereas in 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 a cathedral in a church space um mm. the experience are much more immersive mm. well uh, um i mean it I've read that that uh, music, the frequency of music, um, they've uh, they've um, found that it affects the cells of the body. Um, mm. So it, it's probably that why we feel then so, you know, relaxed and so in a meditative state when we go and listen to music like that. Because if it if it does uh, if it's true that it does affect the cells of the body, then of course it will, you know, um, create that feeling. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's interesting you bring that up about the, the, the direct resonance between music and the body. And I think there, there, there are multiple parts of it as well, because, you know, one, one has to approach it from, um, you know, you, you, so it, your mindset that you take on when you mm -hmm. approach a musical performance I mean, we've spent this last year uh, at home watching performances online and on the television. And, and, and whilst that's really important and it's taken us, you know, I'm able to talk to you but from, mm. from the comfort of my own home yeah. and watch the performance in Japan, followed by a performance in New York. It's, it's all wonderful and it's great. But that act of going to a space, whether it's a church space, a spiritual space or uh, opera space or a concert space in a parking lot somewhere um that mindset actually i think prepares our body and our mind mm. to receive the music in a particular way and so that is already part of the experience and when you're sitting in the room the resonance that hits not just you but everybody mm. so you know you go and hear a concert of uh, Bernstein and um, you know dancey music and you can almost feel everybody starting to move you can that resonance everybody start to tap their toes and the applause at the end is much more instantaneous and spontaneous mm -hmm. that excitement you you it, it, it sort of everybody resonates with each other not just with the music but with other human beings exactly. um, and I think that that part of things I really hope um, that that we will never lose just because we've spent so much yeah. time watching things at home Mm. I think, well, I think that um, when you are used to going to a concert or used to having live music, I think never could a, a screen replace that. Um, so mm, I think, and absolutely. I've spoken to many artists over the time of lockdown also, and and I've asked, you know, what do you, how do you see? And, and everybody said that they think audiences will will be so eager to come back and in in and as a matter of fact everybody i spoken to then afterwards would say to me you know tickets sold out immediately and things happening in vienna now that i see or, or speak to uh, uh, artists you know it's sold out and it's uh, everybody is just so eager and excited to to come back and i wonder if it's this also this this suddenly we realized that as an audience what we missed out. And also I've spoken to many dancers and, and many musicians where they say, where they talk about this energy from the audience where they suddenly, well, yeah, we did live stream or we did streamings or we did recordings, but there was always this something missing or they will say, I was so grateful to be able to do a recording, but I missed the audience. You know, I missed having the audience in the, in the theater. So yeah, I think it's definitely what you're saying. You know, we need that, and and we need that whole experience. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And I think the art, um, especially the performing art, um, mm. that ever since the very very early days of of performing arts, that that, that there's always a slight inherent sense of danger, of jeopardy, of people taking risk. Um, and when you're watching something recorded and recorded so well and so beautifully, you just go, well, I, I even even live is maybe different, but but that sense of 
bouncing off the audience. So, you know, uh, if, yeah. it, that 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 risk taking. If you're watching something that's pre-recorded, well, you know it's going to be shiny. It's going to be perfect. It's going to be okay. Um, but when you're watching a live show sitting there, you don't know, uh, is, 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 is he going to hit that high note? Is he going to hit that high note again? Yeah. Are they going to make that shift? Is she going to do four pirouettes? Is six pirouettes? Mm-hmm. How many pirouettes are they going to do? And then that, the fact that they, yes, they have achieved that one moment of danger, the audience responds to it through applause, through gasps. And then that then helps them to go, okay, I'm going to now move and push for the next moment of risk taking mm-hmm. um that's one part of it but also the other part of it is when you are in the moment where um you're supposed to shock you're supposed to move the audience you're supposed to make them laugh make them cry and when you're doing it in a live stream to an empty empty auditorium where they don't cry they don't applause and the chair stays silent that gives you the feeling of what am i who am i doing this for yeah. Um, and, you know, for all that we say, we're inspired by the music, we're inspired by the dance. Ultimately, mm-hmm. as performers, we also do it for the audience and mm-hmm. we need the audience to come back so that we can continue to do it for them. Mm. I, I did. And this was actually what uh, inspired my my project, The Moments in Lockdown, where I photographed uh, artists in their windows. Oh, um, interesting. Pardon? Interesting. Yeah. Um, what what initially inspired me to to carry on with the project was was this idea that you know I was speaking to them and that uh, moment that they are in the window or that they were on the balcony and it was just you know this two three minutes where I took a picture and they were just giving it all and I realized how much. Um, you as musicians and artists, you know, how much you have this urge to give and, you know, to have the audience there and to please, not please in a negative sense, but to, to make the audience feel happy. And, and um, uh, yeah, so that was really what I got from this whole project is this, this extreme need for artists to give, you know, and it's almost as if um, it's, it's, uh, you know, they get they so so much of your lives you dedicate to an art, and it's for this part of of giving, you know, and to so, and, and to give yeah. the audience something to escape into. You know, yeah. I one of the reasons why I love doing and working in a theater is that mm-hmm. are we able to get them into this world for three hours in an evening where they leave reality behind and they come and be submersed in the world of swans and of sugar mm-hmm. sweets and of um, the story of Sleeping Beauty. Um, and for them to be taken on that journey um, with us, it's, it's, it's such an important part of 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 our of everybody's lives of humanity because we all have our strain and stresses especially in this post corona um age and you know we 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 we've all had a difficult day working or something and then you come in and be swept away from it we need it we need it for our soul mm. we need it for our body mm. yeah absolutely but jonathan i want to ask you something on a lighter note now go on then <laughs> But do you have a preconcert? I wouldn't say ritual, but do you have a habit, something that you do before a concert? Oh yeah, we 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 conductors are are full of rituals. Um, okay. I um I I I I have a very specific routine of yeah. getting dressed. Um, so yeah. I, I I like to get dressed slowly and bit by bit. Of course, I'm not just sitting in my dressing room naked, so don't worry. You, the, oh, the, okay, the, okay. It's, it's, all, it's all very calm, <laughs> but it's 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 about it's about the slow slow moving because you know the, the rehearsal process in the day is it can sometimes get quite intense, but it's really mm-hmm. nice to have that moment then to just okay, I've got I I, I like to start with I'm 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 going to do uh, I'll do my trousers half an hour before. And then the mm-hmm. shirt 15 minutes before, and then the shoes five minutes before, and then the tie just like just as 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 I'm going on. And I never put on my conducting jacket until I am right at the pit door, um, until the very last minute. I like putting that on actually when I hear the oboist A 
uh, when the orchestra's tuning up. Um, yeah. It comes a little bit from um, my days when I used to play cricket. Um, yeah. Sort of a British um, baseball, if you like, um, where you sort of walk out to bat and, 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 and you're sitting there just before you go out to bat um, the batsman before you is is playing and you're sitting there getting nervous and you're looking at the bowler thinking oh my god he's throwing the ball really really fast and what's mm. what's going to happen and 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 I I would always keep my gloves off until the very last moment um, and so that when I'm out when I'm when, when the previous person's out and I'm walking out to bat and I'm just like still quite relaxed and I put my gloves on okay I'm now in the zone um, oh, okay. and it's the exactly same yeah. for me for me conducting. Um, so I have that side of things. Um, I have a little lucky charm on my jacket, which is the shape of a plane, um, because I fly planes as a hobby, oh, um, okay. and that was that was that was a thirtieth birthday present from my sister. So it was like a little um, plane um, uh, brooch that I not brooch like a little pin. Um, oh, yeah, that yeah. Yeah. Actually, sometimes I have a habit of just playing with when I just could just like just fiddling with it, um, oh, yeah. especially in a, in a ballet performance in between, I don't know, applauses or something. So I think yeah. all of those things, it's just to gear myself towards being um, more relaxed about it yeah. um, and being more, but relaxed, not in a, not, not in a not nervous way, yeah. Yeah. but a relaxed in a more, um, more, more casual way so that mm. I can always remain grounded. Mm. Um, so that I, I, I'm not like, okay, I, I am the conductor. Um, oh, it's just okay, like, yeah. I'm, I'm just, I, I'm just yeah. me and I'm just going to help make this performance yeah. as good as we can. And, you know, it's, it's, yeah. it's staying grounded, you know? Yeah. So it's almost like I'm going to hit the ball now. Like yeah, you did. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but I, but I'm, 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 I'm going yeah. to do this in a, in a way that is, that, 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 that is going to be, um, exciting nice but it's going to be yeah. human for everybody yeah yeah um and then then now your your conducting jacket do you um do you conduct in a frock uh no i um it, it's it's interesting you asked that um but i i don't really do the full um white tie um yeah. anymore because um I, I i like the just just a dinner jacket but with a long thin black tie look okay. um it, it's a it's a little bit more I, I don't know. It's it's a it's, it's a little bit more twenty first century, I suppose. Oh, okay, um, yeah. But I'm sure there'll be a time when somebody says to me, "Look, you you really should put a white tie on." But also oh, depends okay. on depends on, on on the situation think, as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Depends on it depends on the production. Yeah, and uh, shoes. Uh, I yeah. Ask the girls, I, now I ask the girls all about their dresses and their shoes, and I always feel I have to ask the men as well. Otherwise, they'll think I'm sexist. <laughs> <laughs> no, quite right. And it's really interesting because with shoes, it goes a little bit back to my organ playing days, actually. Yeah. Um, I like pointy shoes, and but pointy and shiny. Um, and just like an organist would, you would have a pair of shoes before performance. I have a pair of shoes reserved exactly for uh, just for conducting in. Oh, so, okay. yeah, so so shiny and pointy. Okay, but I know because sometimes the the um you know like violinists and and flutists uh, when I ask them about the shoes they say and and singers also they they have to be grounded really you know so yeah. for for um you know I spoke to a, a violinist and he explained to me that how important the shoes are for him his shoes and now I'm wondering if it with conductors do you also have that to have that feeling of this uh, huh. very groundedness. Um, yeah, that, well, for me, it's more in my personality. But um, I think yeah. for for me, in terms of the physical side of it, is is the is is the collar that's really important, yeah. and the, how 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 the jacket restricts you because I like to you know we need to move and we need to yeah. breathe. Um, so if this gets too tight, then it gets a little mm. bit uncomfortable. Um, so yeah, I so I think that's another reason why I do the black tie rather than the bow tie thing because this 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 you have to get this quite tight um to make that uh, work yeah so jonathan what's the next for you now so you are because you're now at the royal royal opera house um and so i i, I am lucky in that i um am sharing um my time between the royal opera house and um northern ballet where i am oh, the music okay. director 
mm-hmm. um, but also I have um, some other orchestras um, in the country um, and also elsewhere. So it, it's it, I'm looking forward to a season where, well, firstly, things are more normal um, yeah. and more regular. Um, at Northern Ballet, we are starting the season with a ballet called Dangerous Liaisons after the mm-hmm. play uh, with the same story um, with music by Vivaldi. Mm-hmm. Um, then the company goes on to give the world premiere of a ballet called Merlin about um, the wizard Merlin. Oh, um, yeah. oh wow. Um, with, with a brand new score by a gentleman called Grant Olding. Yeah. Um, he, he has a very theatrical, musical theatre background, and it is his first ballet for a classical acoustic orchestra. And it's been really interesting to see how the two worlds are going to fusion yeah. um, together, mixed together. Mm. At the same time, um, I'm, I'm working on the um, Dante project um, mm. at the Royal Opera House, which is this new ballet um, by Wayne McGregor with Thomas Adesh as the composer. Um, the company already premiered the first act of what is going to be a three-act full-length ballet um, after um, Dante's um, uh, uh, amazing journey um, through hell, through heaven to hell, or hell to heaven, which I, I think it's that way around, from infernal to purgatory to heaven. Um, and so um, it's going to be really exciting to be working into the autumn, into two new world premieres. In fact, the two... Mm-hmm. Um, full-length world premieres um, in the UK in the ballet Amazing. world so that's that's wonderful and then yeah. of course uh, we move into the Christmas time when it's full of nutcrackers and, oh yeah um, yeah 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 and but all I would the while love... got some concerts going on which is wonderful yeah I would love to speak to you in the autumn about that um uh, the, the ballet um just say the name again uh the the one with northern ballet is called Merlin um, yeah, no, the no, one, the one the Royal Ballet is called the Dante Project. Dante, yeah, Dante. Um, because that would be very interesting to talk about. I mean, you'd probably be better off talking directly to Kuhn about that. Um, I'll because, contact, you know, oh, is, he, is he involved in yeah. that one? I'll contact yeah, him. Ex- absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so he, obviously, he, he was also involved in the initial start of it. And you can also talk to him about the, I mean, the, the Royal Ballet has some really exciting um, performance is coming up. Um, Dante is hopefully not going to be our only world premiere for next season because um, okay. we've got things deferred and de- delayed. Okay. So if we're able to do to to be looking at more than one world premieres um, for the okay. for the next season, then all the better. Yeah. But I think um, Kuhn will be the better person to talk to. Okay, about. I'll I'll speak to Kuhn. But listen, I thank you so much for your time. And uh, it was so lovely to talk to you and um, and so insightful, everything you, you told me about the ballet conducting. It's many things I didn't even realize. And uh, yeah, but um, uh, when you ever come to Vienna, you have to let me know so that we could grab a coffee and meet in person, not over, not, not just over Zoom. That yeah. would be wonderful. And uh, Petra, thank you so much for the in- invitation. It's, uh, yeah, it's such no. a pleasure to speak with you. And um, in fact, I was, I was listening to your interview with Laura Day, um, who you might recognize this exact same background <laughs> from, from a couple of months I was, ago. I, was, I wanted to ask, but I wasn't sure. But yeah, no, I couldn't do it together. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and, and I, I, I heard wonderful things and, and uh, I, I followed your interviews from then on. So yeah, it, it's, it's, oh, it's a pleasure so to be much. here. And um, really, really nice to talk to you. And absolutely, hopefully um, we'll be in Vienna before too long. Once all these travel restrictions relax, yes. very much on our high on our bucket list of places to go to. Yeah, because it's so now here is so uh, free and open. It's unbelievable. It's so lovely. Mm-hmm. And it's, you know, we've got so many now um, performances in the parks. And uh, I was at a f- uh, performance the other night in the park. And, you know, it's, it's so lovely that they do this and that everybody is now in the spirit and people attend and people are so enthusiastic to support the artists. So wonderful. this is really wonderful, yeah. And I was so happy to speak to Laura. Yeah, she's such a lovely girl. And uh, um, it was yeah, so she, great. She, was, yeah. she was happy to talk to you as well. Uh, and again, recently with the Van Gogh Project. Which yes, is it's amazing, amazing that she does that or that she did that, yeah. But um, Jonathan, send my love to Laura. And we'll oh, well, hopefully we'll speak soon. Okay. Let me know Pleasure when you have something in, in at Northern that you want to speak to me about. That would be great. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Okay, Patrick. Okay. 
See you soon. Bye.